struggles, emotional struggles, Lord, just pray that you would touch our hearts with your truth and encourage us to serve and obey you today. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The sermon title this week is Beware Hate. Beware Hate. And so I thought, well, I'll look for some illustrations this morning on the, uh, the news to see if there's any examples of hatred uh, on the morning news. I was really concerned that I wasn't going to be able to find any. <laughs> so, uh, just a few of the tidbits. Uh, in Iraq, nine police officers were murdered. Um, in New York, two Muslim men were murdered after, just after leaving their mosque. Um, and in Milwaukee, on Friday, uh, five people were murdered. And then uh, on Friday, and then Saturday, after a police officer <coughs> shot and killed an armed individual, um, there were riots and vandalism and buildings that were burned to the ground. In the water. This last night, through the night. Uh, rioting, basically, in the streets. So um, our world is full of hatred, right? Uh, we can't do really much about their hatred. The problem that we need to be worried about is our own hatred as Christians. Um, last time we looked at conflict and how we need to be uh, prepared to deal with conflict internally. First, um, you need to be able to be respectful to the person you're in conflict with. If you, are, if you cannot be respectful to the person you're, you're in conflict with, there's no way you can resolve it. The second thing is to manage your emotions. I never get upset when I'm in conflict. I'm surprised the ceiling didn't open up and the lightning come down and destroy me. Uh, I, I have a tendency to get emotional, emotionally charged when I'm uh, upset about something and uh, can become very vocal about how I feel about things. Uh, but if, in order to, to be able to deal with conflict, you have to be able to manage your emotions. And then the last thing is you have to be able to listen to reason. You have to be able to stop, wait, and think, right? And, and if someone, look for people's advice on how to be able to resolve conflict. And we talked about how uh, Abigail, as David was coming to Nabal's house to kill all the men in the household, stopped him and said, you shouldn't do this because you're breaking the law. You should not take vengeance for yourself. And she was quoting of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 and 18. And I wanted to take a closer look at this because this is really the beginning of the conversation about hatred in, in the scriptures. Uh, Leviticus 19, verses 17 through 18. It says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I know Lord. We all hear the love your neighbor as yourself part. We say it over and over again. Non-Christians all over the world use that phrase. But they don't say anything about the first phrase in this statement. And that phrase is, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. And who's our brother? Anybody, everybody, any human being. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. So I wanted to look this morning at hate. The title of the sermon is Beware Hate. The word hate means to dislike, to be hostile to, or to loathe someone. It is therefore the opposite of love. Whereas love draws and unite, unites, hate separates and keeps distant. Hate is expressed as an emotional attitude that can cause you to do several different things. 
this is, this is important to me, to understand what hatred is. Because there are people I don't like. Is there, do, do you have, let me see those hands. Is there anybody, anybody out there who has someone they don't like? Come on. Um, did you just call him a liar? That's what I was thinking too. So does, just because we dislike someone, does that mean we hate them? I don't no. think so. Let's look at this. Let's look at the, 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 the definition. It's in your bulletins. It's in the, on the YouVersion app, uh, in your uh, YouVersion app, if you want to look there. It's uh, a wish to have no contact or relationship with someone. Not, not limited, uh, not metered, <laughs> but no contact or relationship. You never want to see or talk to that person again. The next level, we'll call them levels, is opposing someone. Your job, your job in life, not your, your job in life is to stand in their way. You're going to do everything you can to make their life miserable. That's hatred. Let's bring it up a notch. Having ill will towards someone. Not only do you want to make their life miserable, you want bad things to happen to them. Move it up a notch to detest someone. You dislike them intensely. You're constantly fixated on how much you don't like this person and then ultimately is to despise someone to regard with contempt and disgust. That's hatred. You get the, get the idea? I think hatred is kind of like a spectrum where it starts, it can, there's a line at which we move from dislike to hatred. And it's, it's when we cross that line where uh, we find we have the most problems. When do you know you cross the line? Well, let's uh, look at uh, number two in the outline. Well, first, the observation I want to make about that is in order for us to be able to deal with conflict, Hatred must not be a part of the process. You cannot resolve conflict with someone you hate. Does that make sense? Yes. So hatred should not be a part of the, uh, the situation. Um, number two in the outline, John helps us understand hatred. John, we're going to bounce back and forth. I, you know, I'm not really sure about this message. I won't decide until it's over. Isn't that the way you work? You're not really sure about the message. You're not going to decide until... Sometimes uh, Tom doesn't doesn't want to pay me after the messages because they were so bad. <laughs> I went home one Sunday without paying <laughs> Just kidding. So that's the Old Testament. We looked at, at Moses talking about it. Now we're going to look in the New Testament almost toward the end at 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Uh, John talks about hatred for us as Christians. I mean, the, the hatred uh, in the you shall not hate your brother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself is kind of a universal principle that everybody should live by. But we as Christians especially, it matters for us whether we hate people. Look at 1 John 3, 10 through 12. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Right? And that's the, you shall love your neighbor. He's referring to you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he's referring to. Verse 12, he says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So John is saying that, that for us as Christians, when we are loving, we look like God's children. When we are hateful, we look like Satan's children. Is that important? It is kind of, because we're here for a job, and that job is to share the gospel. And if my personality, my demeanor, my interactions with people make it appear as though I'm a child of Satan, what does that do to the gospel? It throws it away. It's worthless in my mouth because of the hatred in my heart. All right. So what is hatred? First John 3.15 John goes on to say, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So, I 
always thought that Jesus said that hatred was murder. But it's not. It's John. John says it here that hatred is murder. And he explains that it's... Is that pretty significant? I mean, if it's... If, if in God's scale, hatred weighs the same as murder, that's pretty significant. And I think that's what he's saying. So then John goes on and says in verse 17... Uh, how hatred is manifested. How do you know you hate someone? I mean, we've talked about these other things, but how do you know when you cross that line from dislike to hatred? Here it is in John 3, 7, 1 John 3.17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So when do I know I hate someone? When I am not willing to to help them. If I am not willing to help someone who is in need, then I hate them. Okay? Do you agree with that? Yep. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Let's keep going. Hatred is a significant sin that negatively impacts how we treat the person we hate. All right. uh, number three in your outline. So, John brings up Cain and Abel. Great story. If you're not Abel. Or Cain. Um, so we're going to look at that story. We're going to jump now from back from the New Testament, back into the Old Testament. I think this is the first sermon I've ever done this, this kind of thing with. So let's, let's start with the story, okay? Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and they, God puts them there, and, and he says, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, tend the garden, and but don't eat the fruit. And so, of course, Adam and Eve eat the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they fall into sin. And so they become sinners. And God, to protect them, drives them out of the garden. What was God protecting them from? The tree of life. Because if they ate the tree of life, then they would live forever. And if they lived forever, guess what couldn't happen? Jesus couldn't die for their sins. Their ch children would live forever. And Jesus, because he, if he was born eventually, could not die. And in order for us to be forgiven, what has to happen? Someone has to die. So God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden to protect them from themselves. Yep. And then they have children. First Cain, and then Abel. And so here we pick up in verse 1, uh, verse 2 actually. Uh, it says uh, that Eve bore again, and this time uh, she bore his brother Abel, Cain's brother Abel. Now Abel, Abel it says, was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. It's funny. My kids are all the same. <laughs> Josh is looking at me, what are you talking about? They're all different. We're all different. We are all driven by different things. Some people like to work with their hands. Some people can't stand to work with their hands. Some people like to be outside. Some people like to be inside. Some people like to be alone. Some people like to be with people. We are all made differently. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Right? Amen. And those differences are not just differences in behavior, but they're differences in passions and the things that drive us. Each of us are driven by different things as well. All right? Uh, so people have different passions and different drives. So let's move on to verse 3. This is where we step into the conflict. It says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. That sounds like a really good thing, right? What is? What are one of Cain's passions? Farming, obviously farming, but what else? Worship. He wants to worship God. You get that? You see that? It wasn't Abel who brought the offering first. It was Cain. It was Cain's idea. He wanted to worship God. So uh, he brings an offering to the Lord. And so Abel thinks, Abel, this is like a lot of younger kids, uh, does the same thing as his brother does, wants to do the same things as his brother. So Abel decides that he's going to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, an offering to the Lord, and he brings the firstborn of his flock, and they're fat. So uh, Cain brings a grain offering, and Abel brings uh, a, 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 an offering of 
Is it sheep? Goats? Sheep. Is there anything wrong with you, either one of those offerings? No. The Jews brought grain offerings to the Lord. It was a part of the law. They had to do that. And then they also brought animal sacrifices to the Lord. So it wasn't about the offering itself, I don't think, at this point. Um, but it says in verse 4, And the Lord re respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. I don't know how he showed that, but apparently it was an obvious way in which God, maybe God burned it up with fire like he did in other times in the, in the, uh, the Old Testament, or maybe God was there in person. Like when he walked through the garden with Adam and Eve, he was there in person, and he took it, or maybe he said something, we don't know. But he made it clear that Abel's offering was accepted, and Cain's offering was not accepted. And so what happens? Cain was very angry, and his comments fell. All right. This reveals another one of Cain's passions. Cain's passionate about farming. He's passionate about worship. What, is also, what also is he passionate about? acceptance. He's looking for acceptance. Right? He wants favor or something. Yeah, he's looking for affirmation, something from God. And he doesn't get it. And so he gets really angry. And of course, who's to blame for that? It's not Cain. Certainly not Cain. It's not God because there's nothing he can do about that. So it must be Abel. I'm angry with Abel. So, uh, I, I, here's what I put in the observation there. Is that Cain's passion was for worship and acceptance. Abel's passion was for acceptable worship. You see the difference there? There's a huge difference between the two. So God confronts uh, Cain in verse 6 and says, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well... Will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you, but you should rule over it. So God, did you ever do that to your kids? Did your parents ever do that to you, warn you? Hey, don't touch them. It's hot. Right? Did you say that to your kids? God's warning, uh, Cain, be careful. You are in some serious trouble here. You are on your way to destruction. Um... He didn't listen. In verse uh, 8, now it says, Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass with, when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Now, you know, it's interesting. We don't know how long it was between the, the, the sacrifice and God's warning and the time he actually killed Abel. Uh, if Another story that, that talks about hatred is the story of Absalom, Tamar, and uh, Amnon. Um, Absalom and Tamar were brother and sister. They had the same mother and father. Uh, Amnon was, uh, had a different mother, same father. And Amnon violated his sister Tamar. And uh, Ab Absalom hated Amnon. He hated him. It said, but here's what it says. It says he waited two years. Didn't say a word to him for two years before he killed him. He waited two years. Hatred has no time limits. It can go on and on and on and on. So I don't know how long it took, but eventually Cain killed Abel. Abel fell victim to Cain's hatred. So then in verse 9, God says to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? This classic, you know, you all heard this. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? The voice of your, brother, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will be ha happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone find him, finding him should kill him. So first Abel falls victim to Cain's hatred. Then Cain falls victor, victim to his hatred. So what can we learn from this story? Well, let's start from point one, is that God's, God says hatred is a sin, first of all, in, in that statement, you shall not, do you think God, what does he mean when he says, you shall not hate your brother? Is it the same as, you shall not kill, or you shall not lie? I mean, it's a command, it, it, it's a command, so it's sin. So God says hatred is sin, and that uh, it takes us out of his will. I mean, if you, you look at that, uh, um, in the first John passage, you, you, you can't be living a godly life while you hate someone and, and be accomplishing his will in the way that he wants you to. And the story of Cain and Abel helps us to see the real life impact hatred can have on our relationships. Um, and I've got some observations or applications I want you to see there. First of all, we have we all have different drives and passions um, that we may or may not be aware of. Do you know all the things that drive you, all the passions that drive you? All the, I don't think many of us do. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Why do I eat that 50th meatball? I don't know. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know sometimes why I do so. Why do I get mad when the person in front of me is going 40, 40 miles an hour and 55? Why? I don't always know that. So uh, we have different drives and passions that we may or may not be aware of. The hardest conflicts to resolve are the ones that come closest to the driving passions of our heart. That's why Cain and Abel couldn't resolve this conflict. Because this passion that they were having conflict over, this need for acceptance was too close to his heart. It's the push, pushing his button. Has anybody ever pushed your button? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's like this little heart button. You push it and you're going to make people angry. You know, it's like the Hulk. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> So when we, when we start pushing these, these buttons that, that are directly tied to people's hearts, we, we, we have a hard time. And the, the next one is the best time to deal with your anger is before it turns into hatred. That's what God was trying to do for Cain is to get him to deal with his anger before it turned into hatred. You cannot keep your hatred from causing you to harm the person you hate. You just can't do it. You're going to eventually do something to give expression to that hatred. And then you cannot escape the spiritual consequences of hatred. Look what, what 1 John 4, 20 and 21 says. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So if I hate my brother and say I'm living a godly life, what am I? Liar. I'm a liar. 1 John 2, 9, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Verse 11, But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. If I say that I am living in the will of God, am I? If I am in, in the light. If I am in the center of God's will, am I, am I living, am I truly there? No, I am in darkness. I don't know where God is leading me can't know where God is leading me because my heart is, is, is darkened by that hatred that I have for, for the, per, the person who's offended me. In many instances, offenses are real. You know, like uh, in the case of Absalom and uh, Amnon, there was a real offense there. There was a real offense, and that was the, the root of his hatred. But in the case of Cain and Abel, was it really Abel's fault that that Cain's sacrifice wasn't accepted? You know what really Jesus says is murder? Jesus says that he who is angry has thumos, no, or gizzo, pardon me, 
who, he who has anger in his heart without justification is guilty of murder. If you are angry with someone for no reason and you know that the person has done nothing and yet you hate them anyway, that's murder. If you, if you continue to maintain your anger with them. That per, it's not murder. It's like murder. It's not murder. I mean, you're not killing anybody. Uh, but it's like murder. It's as bad as murder. So what is the solution? Okay, we should not. Do you, do you all see what I'm saying? Yes. It's a struggle in my own life, right? People do things that offend me. They hurt me. People have hurt me through my entire life, you know? Not constantly, but through my entire life. I've been hurt by people. How's that? That's a better way of saying it, right? And, and so we, we have this accumulated hurt, and, and uh, that's a big reason why we do the prayer of release and, and dealing with that and, and releasing all those things that we can think of because we don't want, I don't want hatred in my heart, and so I try to keep up with it, but they keep coming. People keep doing things to offend me. I never do anything to offend anybody else, so nobody's ever praying the prayer of release with me. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Right, so so I want I, I want to be as as free of anger as I can because I want to be as far away as hatred as I can be. Because the closer I get to hatred, the easier it becomes to jump in, to to be there. So the only solution for hatred is forgiveness. It's the only solution. You see that? That it's not. There's not justice. There's there's justice. Shooting someone does not bring healing. Somebody kills your 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 family member, and so you kill that person. Uh, it does not bring healing. The only thing that brings healing is forgiveness. And uh, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're just talking about hatred. And it's, it's the danger of it. That's why uh, somebody asked me, is that the, should the sermon title be Beware of Hate? I don't, I don't think so. I think Beware of Hate is, is strong. It needs to be a strong warning to us. Next week, we're going to talk about confrontation. So I'm going to pick several of you to confront during the message. <laughs> now nobody's going to come to church. Just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Okay. We're going to look at the different ways people are confronted in the in the scriptures. You know, um, how many of you are really good at confronting people? Oh, okay. All right. Um, when I say really good, the person you confront always repents and and does what they're supposed to do. Okay. Okay. All right. You see what I'm saying? All right. You're a little conf confused about being good at confronting. Being good at for confronting doesn't mean that you, you tell people what's, what's wrong with them. Good at confronting means when you tell people what's wrong with them, they do the right thing. Now, you can't be perfect. You can't always have that happen. But that's our desire. That's the goal. The goal of confronting is not to make them feel bad. The goal is to make them change their behavior, to realize they've hurt you, and to say they're sorry. It doesn't always happen. But there are different approaches we can take in confrontation that will help us confront people. You want to be good confronters, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sure you're not. Okay. We're going to sing one last song. So I'm going to have the worship team come up and we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you that you are, uh, you are a patient and loving God. And Lord, as you warned Cain those thousands of years ago of the dangers that hatred meant for him. Lord, you give us the same warning. The same things that, that happened to Cain, the judgment, the consequences of our hatred. The separation that our hatred causes between ourselves and you, Lord, is still as serious today as it was back then. And so, Lord, I pray that if there are any of us who have hatred in our heart, that we would, we would realize the danger that it has put us in. That we would not want to maintain that hatred, but that we want to be delivered from. Lord, that's what we want, to be delivered from our hatred so that we can be in your will, the center of your will, loving you and loving the people around us. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit who convicts us, and I pray that, uh, that he would do that in this instance, and that we would do whatever it takes to remove the hatred from our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.